Good morning. So I want to start talking about chapter five today. And the meat of chapter five, and indeed pretty much all of the homework problems on chapter five, what we're going to be learning is paracyclic reactions, reactions that involve the reorganization of electrons and bonds without a discrete intermediate in the midst of any of these reactions. Niels Alder reaction, you all learned in sophomore organic chemistry, is an example of a paracyclic reaction. There are three types of paracyclic reactions, electrocyclic reactions, cycloadditions, that's what the Diels Alder reaction is, and sigmatropic rearrangements, reactions that m involve moving sigma bonds over pi systems. So that's going to be the meat of the chapter. And we might touch on these at the very end of today's lecture. But today's lecture is going to, and we'll go into them in more depth in the next two lectures, but today's lecture is really going to set the stage for paracyclic reactions, and it's going to be what I hope is a review of molecular orbitals, and we'll also touch briefly on aromaticity. And, you know, I, this is something you've been steeped in since freshman chemistry and even, even since high school chemistry, and yet it's good to pull it together and take my perspective on it, and ultimately where we're going to go is into polyenes, into dienes and trienes that are going to set the stage for all of these reactions. So I want to go reasonably quickly through sort of the basic tenets of molecular orbital theory with a real focus on where we want to be as organic chemists. So, okay, the basic tenets of molecular orbital theory are that molecular orbitals are formed by the combination of atomic orbitals. So atoms have 1s and 2s and 2p, 2px, 2py, 2pz, orbitals for hydrogen and carbon and oxygen and nitrogen and so forth. And we mix those valence orbitals in forming bonds. So at the very simplest level, the thing everyone has seen since freshman chemistry, if not high school chemistry, is the hydrogen molecule, right? Hydrogen molecule can be thought of as bringing together, forming the hydrogen molecule, can be thought of as bringing together two hydrogen atoms, right? So here's the 1s orbital of one hydrogen atom, the little dot in the center is meant to represent not the orbital but the nucleus just to help you show the locations. The orbital, of course, isn't a hard sphere like a tennis ball. It's sort of like a cloud that's heavy in the center with a lot of density and puffier and puffier as you move out. But given the fact that I can't show puffiness, I'll just write our 1s orbital as sort of this little tennis ball-like circle with a dot in the center. And the basic premise of molecular orbital theory is that in making molecular orbitals, we combine atomic orbitals, we combine them in a variety of different ways. If we start with two atomic orbitals, we combine them in two ways to make two new molecular orbitals. And the basic idea is what's called linear combinations of atomic orbitals, which is, in short, we add them or subtract them. And often there'll be some coefficients in there. And so we would add the 1s and the 1s of two hydrogens to form the hydrogen molecule and to form specifically the sigma orbital. And so here's the sigma 1s. Sigma means it's axially symmetric. So you can think of this sort of as a big, like a blimp, like a Goodyear blimp shaped area engulfing the two hydrogen nuclei, 
And again, of course, since the molecular orbitals are the orbitals in general are density functions, this is not a rigid shell like the Goodyear blimp, but rather a cloud, a cylindrical cloud, sort of hot dog shaped or fat little sausage shaped cloud, puffier and puffier as you get out with density falling off. So we can combine their atomic orbitals in two ways. We have to make two molecular orbitals from the two hydrogen atomic orbitals from the two 1s atomic orbitals. We can combine them in an additive way or a subtractive way. If we combine them in a subtractive way, we get the sigma star orbital sigma star 1s orbital. Now, what this representation means, just like our p orbital, right? If this is a p orbital here, p orbital has electron density on one side of the atom, electron density on the other side. We have a node here in our p orbital, meaning that there's an area right at the atom where there's no electron density. Over here, we have a node, in other words, right between the two nuclei. There is no electron density in that plane in the center. Then we have puffy electron density coming out this way, puffy electron density coming out that way. And so this is higher in energy, the electrons in a, 1S, in a sigma star 1s orbital don't spend much time anywhere between the nuclei, it's further out. And so this is higher in energy. In fact, we say this is a bonding orbital. And the sigma 1s is an anti-bonding orbital. All right, and you've all been seeing this since high school and the like. All right. So next tenet that I want to cover is that bonding occurs through the greater stabilization of the electrons in the bonding molecular orbitals. In other words, if the atoms, if the electrons are in atomic orbitals and the atoms are far apart, it's a higher energy configuration than bringing those two hydrogen atoms together, forming a molecular orbital, and having the electrons occupy the molecular orbital. So if we make a little energy diagram where we plot E on the y-axis and we sort of show the energies of the atomic orbitals, so here's our hydrogen 1s, and here's our hydrogen 1s orbital, and we have one electron. I'm going to, it looks like his here. I'm going to go ahead and just put the 1s right below, right below. I'll put our hydrogen here, our hydrogen here. I'll show that it's our hydrogen atom. When we bring those two 1s orbitals together and mix them, in an additive fashion and a subtractive fashion to get our molecular orbitals, and I'm going to try to sort of make my energies about right here, we get our sigma 1s, our sigma star 1s. We have two electrons. We put our two electrons in the bonding molecular orbital, and we say, okay, we get hydrogen. Hydrogen is stable because we put our two electrons in a lower energy orbital. Yeah? Uh, is the difference between the, uh, I guess, the atomic orbitals from the molecular orbitals to the anti-bonding and bonding, are they the same distance away? They are the same distance, and I haven't sketched that that well. If I want to, I think maybe I'd go a little higher. What I was trying to do is sort of split the difference. So yeah. So. No, wait, the bonding is lower than the anti-bonding. Yeah, but it's not the same. The 
you think it's not the same gap. Yeah. Okay. Is the anti-bonding more destabilizing than the bonding? Well, I mean, the anti-bonding, is, is it more destabilizing? If, if the energy gap is a little lower, if it's non-symmetrical, then I'd say no. But I think, we're, I think we're getting kind of into splitting hairs here. I mean, actually, you know, I, have to, I really have to come down to yes, because the next example, okay, so you go ahead and you take helium, right? It, it is, it has to be, because we go ahead, we take helium, where we take our filled orbitals now, mix them together, this is the same thing, it's our 1s and our 1s, you mix them together like so, and now you try to make the helium-2 molecule, and it's unstable, right? I mean, there's, if, in other words, our sigma star and our sigma, now basically those energies are offsetting each other. There's no bonding energy bringing two helium molecules, helium atoms together to try to make a helium molecule. I would argue to a first order approximation, you could say basically we're not getting anywhere in terms of stabilization. If there's some additional effects that slightly offset things, I think it goes beyond the scope of of what we need to know in terms of this course. Other questions, though? All right. What this is setting us up for is basically the notion of what makes for bonding. Now, the last thing that I need to do to really set the stage for paracyclic reactions, for cycloadditions, is to bring us to pi orbitals, right? So we've made sigma orbitals. Sigma orbitals are axially symmetric. When we mix p orbitals, we can get pi orbitals, if the p orbitals are suitably oriented, and the pi orbitals are generally separate from the sigma orbitals. Let me show you, show you what I mean. All right, so again, coming back to, to tenets, pi systems can generally be thought of as separate from the sigma systems from not all sigma systems, but from sigma systems to which they are orthogonal. And again, going back to the very, very basics, if I wanted to talk about something very, very basic, I'd talk about, say, ethylene, right? It's sort of the archetypal molecule that has a pi system and a sigma framework. So in ethylene, you have your carbon atoms. Your carbon atoms have a, we'll call it a 2PZ orbital, it just depends how you set up your axes. We'll talk about it as two pz orbitals. And so in our atomic orbitals, you have the sigma framework of the ethylene molecule occupying the plane orthogonal to the blackboard. And I've drawn the two pz in the plane of the back blackboard, so here's our ethylene. We now have the two pz, and we're going to be able to combine those atomic orbitals to make up a pi system. And again, we can combine the two pz orbitals in an additive fashion or subtractive fashion. Two atomic orbitals go in to make two molecular orbitals. So our pi orbitals look something like this. We still have a plane, a node in the plane, an area that has no electron density in the plane of the molecule. But now, we bring together electron density above and below the sigma plane, be below the framework 
of the plane of the molecule, the sigma framework of the molecule. And so here's our pi type orbital here. And we can combine them again in a bonding fashion or an anti-bonding fashion. We are combining our 2p orbitals. So again, I'll draw our sigma framework of the molecule like so. And now for our pi star, you can envision sort of the subtractive combination of those two p orbitals. It's a, a lousy drawing here, a little bit too far over. The subtractive combination of those two p orbitals to give us our pi star. And so now you get one more node, you get a nodal plane orthogonal to the blackboard. So I'll go ahead and sort of draw an additional nodal plane here. And in general, Pi orbitals, because there's less overlap, they are higher in energy than the sigma bonding orbitals. The pi orbitals in general, at least the, the highest occupied pi orbital, HOMO, and the lowest pi unoccupied molecular orbital, the LUMO, generally lie above the sigma orbitals that make up the CH framework and the CC framework of the molecule, which makes the pi orbitals special in that these are the frontier orbitals, these are the orbitals that are taking place, that are participating in the reaction. And so again, we can create an energy diagram that focuses on these orbitals. And we can think about combining our 2pz and our 2pz from our two carbons, and each of them has an electron, and we combine them in an additive sense or in a subtractive sense. We have two electrons, and so we put our two electrons in our pi, and we have our vacant pi star. Thoughts or questions up to this point? Yeah. Um, I just have a general question. What is the physical significance of phasing in this area? This physical significance of phasing becomes that you have equal electron density, let's say here and here, but when we're trying to overlap molecules and form new bonds, the phasing has to match. So what we're going to see as we progress through the chapter is that when we try to form a new bond, if we take a positive phase, positive is going to be our white area, and a negative phase, and we try to overlap them from two different molecules, if there is a mismatch, we can't form a bond because we can't share electron density between them. So the main difference in phasing is simply that you'll have electron density here, you'll have electron density here, but when you're trying to combine molecules, they won't match. And you're going from basically high electron density right here, less, 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 none right in the plane, more, more, more. In terms of the wave function, it is basically a negative sign or a positive sign. I mean, so, okay, so that's the significance. Other questions? Thoughts? Yeah. Why the anti-bonding and the bonding orbitals are like just 
for them. Uh, for the base game, I guess. Okay. Yeah. Um, like, say for, like, water or something, would that be different from the second guy? Would water, oh, so we're only, if you mean where these are relative to other molecules? Yes. Ah, okay. So let's take hydrogen and helium. So in hydrogen and in helium, the 1s orbitals are very different energies. So when I made that diagram for hydrogen and for helium, each diagram was self-contained. The hydrogen 1s actually is way above the helium 1s because you have more nuclear charge. But when I showed them relative to each other, I put them the same because we weren't comparing them. And where you could see this, say, is the energy to ionize, to kick an electron out of a hydrogen atom, it takes much less energy to ionize a hydrogen atom to pull an electron from being in the 1s orbital out to infinity to kick it out than it does for, say, the helium atom where now you have a lower energy. Thank you. Other questions, thoughts? All right, so just as we can go ahead and combine two atomic orbitals, we can combine more than two atomic orbitals. So as we go to conjugated systems where we have multiple double bonds together, we're going to be combining three, four, six, whatever p orbitals together to get three, four, six, whatever molecular orbitals, and we'll call those sigma molecular orbitals. So I'll write this out as another tenet, conjugated pi systems may be viewed as forming delocalized molecular orbitals. And I think the simplest system to begin with, if we took ethylene sort of as an archetype of a pi system, then butadiene, 1,3-butadiene can be thought of as an archetype of a conjugated system. And so it's not purely that you have a double bond here between atoms one and two, and a double bond here between atoms one and two, uh, three and four, but those double bonds interact. And we can combine this, we can make the molecular orbitals and combine them by combining the p orbitals together, the four 2pz orbitals together to make four pi type molecular orbitals. And we'll give those the name sigma 1, sigma 2, sigma 3, and sigma 4. And I'm just going to draw them, whoops, sigma 4. Psi. 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 Thank you, Sebastian. Psi, psi 1, psi 2, psi 3, and psi 4. And I'm going to go ahead. And now we're going to mix those and we're going to get bonding, two bonding type molecular orbitals, two anti-bonding type molecular orbitals. And we're still going to have, so we'll have our little energy diagram, right? We'll show our increasing in energy. We're still going to put our electrons, one electron per atom into those molecular orbitals. So we start with four carbon 2pz orbitals. Each of those has an electron, right? Carbon brings four electrons to the table. You can think of it as bringing one electron in the, well, you can think of it as starting with two in the 2s and two in the p, x and y, if you will and promoting one, if you want to think about it that way, 
promoting one to the p orbital and then combining all of those together so you have a carbon 1s, a carbon 2s, carbon 2px, carbon 2py, and 2pz, each with one electron, mixing them together to make the molecular orbitals. The result is you've got four pi electrons, four pi type molecular orbitals, psi 1, psi 2, psi 3, and psi 4, and the two bonding molecular orbitals are occupied. We can combine in four different ways the pz orbitals to make the, the pi type molecular orbitals. We can combine them in a fully additive fashion where all of the phases go ahead and overlap. And now what I'm doing here is representing the additive combination of the two overlapped orbitals that come together in the additive fashion to make the continuous overlapping orbital here, overlapping phase here and here. In other words, what we're getting here is something that you would think of as being like a big overlapping molecular orbital and we can just, as a little way of keeping track of the number of nodes, think of this sort of as a wave that overarches the four carbon nuclei. And there are no additional nodes orthogonal to the plane of the blackboard. So that's our psi 1. Psi 2, we're going to combine them in such a way that we get one node. And so I'll show you the linear combinations of the atomic orbitals that we're mixing together, like so. Oops. And you can think of this as being sort of a wave that has one node in it, psi 3. like so in terms of our phases. A wave that has two nodes in it, two crossings in it. And psi 4, now no overlap, completely anti-bonding. Psi 2, you know the phasing, you're going to have one node. So basically the rule is more nodes, more crossings as we go up. So one node, okay, you get overlap here between carbon 1 and carbon 2 and be between carbon 2, between carbon 3 and carbon 4, but no overlap between carbons 2 and carbon 3. Now, look at what this model means. What this model means is we filled these two orbitals. What this model means is you've got some electron density shared across the whole pi system, and then some extra electron density shared between atoms number one and atoms number two, and some extra electron density shared between three and four, and some negative overlap between two and three. What does that model translate to? That model translates to the idea that yes, primarily we have double bond character between one and two and three and four, but we get a little bit of extra delocalization. And you could write resonance structures that would go ahead and show that little bit of extra delocalization. From a point of view of geometry, what that means is this double bond between carbon 1 and carbon 2 is a little bit, maybe a hundredth of an angstrom, 
longer than the double bond that you would have in, say, ethylene. Maybe in ethylene it's about 1.34. Maybe it would be a little bit longer, maybe 1.35. And this single bond here between carbon 2 and carbon 3 has a little bit of double bond character. In other words, instead of being the standard sp2, sp2 single bond length, it might be a hair shorter, a hundredth of an angstrom or two one hundredths of an angstrom shorter because we have some delocalization. All right. These types of systems that we're looking at are going to be very useful So let's try, because these are the types of systems that are going to be participating in the paracyclic reactions that we're going to be looking at. So, okay, so if 1,3-butadiene is sort of the simplest system to look at, let us then now look at a system that's slightly more complex and that is 1, 3, 5 hexatriene. And in, the ki in this case, and when we talk about reactions, it's going to be the frontier orbitals the highest occupied molecular orbital, the lowest occupied, un lowest unoccupied molecular orbital. It's going to be the HOMO and LUMO that are the important ones. Those are the ones we're going to want to focus on because that's where we're going to be mixing those orbitals and recombining them in creating reactions, in having reactions. So in the case of 1,3,5 hexatriene, you get six, you bring together six 2pz orbitals, you get six pi-type molecular orbitals, psi 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. And now our key orbitals, our HOMO, are gonna, is going to be psi 3, and our LUMO is going to be psi 4, and you should have the skills to bootstrap your way up to being able to draw the linear combinations of atomic orbitals that make up psi 3 and psi 4. And that type of mnemonic of waves is very useful. So if I think about six carbon 2pz orbitals and a wave that encompasses them, that's going to be psi 1. In other words, we're going to be adding our 2pz from carbon 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, all in an additive sense, much as we've done here to make the molecular orbital psi 1. And for psi 2, we're going to have one node. That node is going to fall between carbons 3 and 4. And for psi 3, we're going to have two nodes, and that's going to fall between carbons 2 and 3, and 4 and 5. Let's see, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So now we go ahead and we have a node, a node, and a node, and that is going to translate So I'm now looking at our linear combination of atomic orbitals. Now we'll combine the atomic orbitals between carbons 1 and 2 in an additive fashion. We're going to then have our node. Here's 3 and 4. Here's 5 and 6. And you think about it, and what that's saying, just as we were talking with butadiene, is we have shared electron density between carbons 1 and 2 that make up double bond character between 3 and 4, between 5 and 6. 
we get anti-bonding interactions between three and four, between two and three, and between four and five. But remember, there are these other side type molecular orbitals that we're not even drawing out here that deal with sharing electron density between all of them. So just as in butadiene, where you get a little bit of double bond character between atoms two and three, a little bit of shared extra electron density over here, not a pure single bond, but a little bit of double bond. In the case of hexatriene, you get shared electron density between three and four, five and six, because your lower orbitals have electron density in them. So psi three is our homo, psi four, so this is our linear combination for our homo. Here's psi four, and now we get one more node. So now we go like so, and our linear combination of atomic orbitals now I can represent like so. And as we begin to look at the reactivity of hexatriene, as we begin to look at the reactivity of butadiene, it's going to be those orbitals, and specifically their phases, that we're going to have to look at and say, how do we overlap the HOMO of one pi system with the LUMO of another pi system to form a bond? Can we simply bring those pi systems together and have a matched overlap of the phases, positive with positive, white with white, negative with negative, black with black, so that as we bring them together, the orbitals now can transform into a new set of bonds. Thoughts or questions? Yeah. Um, are the PS two Y and two Z orbitals present in the spec? No, we are on, so we're only focusing on P Z. So the P X and P Y are getting mixed to make the sigma framework of the molecule. I've arbitrarily chosen Z. We could have had this whole discussion with Y or with X. It's arbitrary. So remember you, your sp2 hybridization. So think about the conceptual model that we use in sophomore organic chemistry, and indeed that we use and think about in general for forming molecules. We say, okay, you make methane by combining your 2s of carbon and your 3, 2p orbitals to make four hybrid sp3 orbitals that point at tetrahedral angles. And those hybrid sp3 orbitals overlap with the hydrogen 1s orbitals. Now, that conceptual model of let's premix the 2s and the 3, 2p orbitals together is a conceptual model. It's not like it happens where first you mix them, they form this hybrid, then they bond with the hydrogens. In practice, what happens is if I were to mix carbon atoms and hydrogen atoms, four, carbon, oh, four hydrogens, one carbon, and they reacted, all the orbitals would combine together. But it's a nice grouping. It's like adding, if I've got a column of numbers to add, and I pick the two that add up to 10, and pick another two that add up to 10, I pre-group them. Commutivity is, is what they would call it. In other words, it doesn't matter how you add things, and so that's the conceptual model that we use. When we think about ethylene or butadiene or hexatriene, we use that same conceptual model with a wrinkle. Now we say, okay, we're going to combine the carbon 2s with the 2px and the 2py to make hybrid sp2 orbitals, 
and we'll have three hybrid sp2 orbitals that point in a trigonal planar arrangement and we'll combine those to make the sigma framework and that leaves the 2pz to form the pi system. Does it actually occur in that sequential order? No, we mix everything together, the orbitals remix, but it is a very handy conceptual and grouping tool. So yeah, the sigma framework and those orbitals, because there's better orbital overlap, because there's S character, those are lower in energy than at least the bonding ones, low bonding sigma ones, are lower in energy than the pi and pi star that end up being or psi three and four in the case of hexatriene or two and three in the case of butadiene that end up making up the basis of our molecule. All right, so that's sort of the gist of polyenes. I want to cover one last set of ideas here which we won't draw upon as much in this chapter, but I think it's, I think it's worth bringing in, and that's cyclic pi systems. So we'll talk about the molecular orbitals for conjugated cyclic pi systems. And the way in which, so we're talking basically now a ring of p orbitals where all the p orbitals, and I'm drawing sort of an arbitrary number and I'm trying to make a ring. But of course the archetype of conjugated cyclic pi systems are cyclobutadiene and benzene, right? And back even you know, in sophomore organic chemistry, you learned cyclobutadiene and benzene are very, very different. Benzene has special stability, we call aromaticity. Cyclobutadiene has a lack of stability, special reactivity, we call anti aromaticity. And the basic molecular orbital diagram that when you get, when you combine p orbitals in a ring, is a diagram like this. Energy goes up, and we go and we combine orbitals in twos until we run out of orbitals, and we put, if we have one more, we put a one, and we go up in energy. That's how it works out. So for cyclobutadiene, We start, we've got four orbitals, four 2pz orbitals, so we make an energy diagram that looks something like this. We start, we get a bonding orbital here. We get an anti-bonding orbital here. And we have a non-bonding level over here, neither anti-bonding nor bonding. In other words, halfway between, at the same basic level as our 2pz orbitals that we're bringing together. Now, we brought four p orbital, four electrons together with our four 2pz orbitals. So we go ahead and we populate our orbitals. And as drawn, right, these have to have opposite spin, these electrons have to have opposite spin. As drawn, we have a biradical, we have a molecule that is destabilized that has special reactivity to it. In practice, what happens is cyclobutadiene does exist. It's not a ground state by radical. The molecule doesn't want to be fully symmetric, so it distorts from a perfect square into a little bit of an elongated rectangle, which brings these two orbitals to ever so slightly different levels, and you populate the lower energy orbital, but the molecule does not have the special stability of benzene. 
Benzene is sort of the opposite, right? Benzene is the archetype of an aromatic molecule. I will write here sort of as a conclusion, anti-aromatic. I'll say special instability. And I'll jump the gun on benzene and say, because we all know benzene is aromatic, it has special stability. And we can make our same type of energy diagram for benzene. And as I said, the basic rules for bringing together six 2pz orbitals in a ring is we get a diagram that looks like this. We start with one orbital, we go two, two until we run out of orbitals, and then we have one. So those are our pi type molecular orbitals of benzene. You've got bonding orbitals here, anti-bonding orbitals higher in energy, this is sort of our zero level. That's the energy of our 2pz right over here. And we put our six electrons in to benzene. They occupy the benzene, uh, they occupy bonding orbitals, and we're getting that special stability of delocalizing six electrons across a cyclic pi system that has six p orbitals. Thoughts or questions? So what about cyclooctatetraene? So cyclooctatetraene Looks like we're going to get us back into the butadiene system. So in other words, we go ahead, we have, this is our 2pz level, so this is our non-bonding. These are anti-bonding levels. These are levels for bonding orbitals. We have eight electrons. We populate our lowest orbitals with eight electrons. And we should be back in the butadiene situation, in the cyclobutadiene situation. And I've already hinted that cyclobutadiene doesn't have a lot of wiggle room but it still tries to avoid being anti-aromatic. It doesn't want that special instability. It doesn't want to be a biradical. As best as it can, it distorts, making two of the bonds a little bit longer, two of the bonds more like double bonds, and so it breaks that anti-aromaticity. Cyclooctatetraene is a bigger ring. It has more conformational stability, more conformational flexibility, and so it does not end up occupying a conformation that looks like a stop sign, but rather it ends up distorting into a tub conformation. And that breaks orbital overlap because you've got a p orbital going like this and another p orbital going like this. So you end up breaking orbital overlap. So 
So you don't have a fully conjugated system. You break the conjugation in the tub conformation. As a result, I'll say breaks conjugation. And as a result, it's not anti-aromatic. If it were fully orthogonal, if your orbitals are fully orthogonal, there is zero delocalization, or as close to zero as possible. Now, here we're not completely orthogonal, so there is a little bit of delocalization. It's exactly, yeah, the orbitals need to be aligned in order to overlap. All right, I will see you on Friday and we will begin talking paracyclic reactions.